that doesn't touch your heart. Fill your chest and make sure you have a heart. <laughs> My word. Thank you, John. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a special song recitation. I don't know if you really want to put it, but uh, I like to try to have a, a vivid mind when reading the Bible. And This whole week, you spent a lot of time meditating on the scriptures and the account of what Jesus went through for you and me. And uh, you may be sitting here today, and maybe you're not saved. Well, you, the Lord loves you. He loves you, and he's, he's glad you're here. You may not understand uh, what he's about or who he is. That's okay. He loves you. And he gave his whole life just for you. He knew you when he went on the cross. He knows you today. The message that I want to preach today, what I feel like the Lord laid on my heart, is simply titled The Greatest Event in, in History. I thought about putting The Greatest Event in Human History, but it's far outside of that. Yeah. The greatest uh, story ever told. It's more than a story. It's truth. It's fact. It's what gives us the ability to have any kind of hope in our lives. You say, well, Pastor, people can have plenty of hope in their lives. And people can have good jobs. And they can have, a, you know... A, Fancy things, and they can have all the friends in the world, and they can have all the pleasures of life. And yeah, they can. But they'll never know. If they don't know Jesus Christ, they'll never know the hope and the joy and the love and the blessings that he brings. To know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords seeks to have a relationship just with you. Amen. That's special. We're going to look at this today. I'm going to turn over to 1 Thessalonians 4.14. Uh, might be a little strange for you for Easter Sunday to start off with that. But you'll see why, Lord willing. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14 to kick it off. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Let's pray. Dear Lord and precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for why we're here today, to honor your Son, Jesus Christ who died on an old rugged cross. He bled, he suffered, and laid down his life, gave it up freely to make a payment for our sin once and for all. As he said, it is finished. But three days later, all that sadness and mourning goes away for he got victory over death and hell, over the grave. He held captivity captive and gives us the victory over our greatest foe. Lord, I pray that you'd empty ourselves of distraction, of the flesh, keep the devil away from us, and Lord, help us to hear your word. Empty me of myself, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me just be a vessel to be used just one more time, that you may be glorified. Lord, let your Holy Spirit fill this house today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Folks, I just want to make this as a small introduction as we're going to build up to something very great. But I want you to look at how simple that verse is today. If we believe, do you believe that Jesus died? Do you believe that he rose again? I do. And I don't doubt it for a second. And I've not looked back from the first day that I accepted Christ as my Savior and turned from my sin. I'm sorry for the way I've lived as a Christian many times, that I wish that I would have lived better for him. I wish that I would have been more faithful. I wish that I would have uh, been more sold out from him and, and years gone by, but I can't change the past. What I can do is do something today to get closer to him. Amen. If you're not saved today, today can be the day that you are born again, that you become a new creature in Christ, that you can know victory, the kind of which you have never known in your life, the peace that passes all understanding. The love and joy that only God can bring you through the love that is Jesus Christ. But we kind of talked a little bit about it in Sunday school. And, you know, we hear a lot of it around Veterans Day and, uh, and Memorial Day. And, you know, that freedom isn't free. And, uh, you know, all gave some, but some gave all. And said, well, Jesus paid it all. He gave everything he had on that cross. He went through the mockery of a false trial. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was mocked. He was laughed at. Uh, he was spit upon. They plucked his beard with their hands. They blindfolded him and smacked him upside his face and said, prophesy on us who hit you. The ultimate disrespect would have stripped him down to be about naked just to sit there and give him out 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. And the Bible says, by his stripes, we are healed. 
Folks, your salvation and what is there for you as a free gift did not go completely free. It's free to you because Jesus paid it all. He did it. And I think of how sad it will be on Judgment Day when so many will stand before and say, why, did you, why should I let you into heaven? And say, well, I've done this, and I went here, and I did this, and I did that, and all this. And he's going to say, but depart from me, I never knew you. How sad that Jesus paid the sin debt for everybody in the world, but so few ever come to repentance. So few ever actually take him up on his gift and just accept the fact that Jesus paid it all for you with his blood. Maybe some other day. Maybe some other day I'll get saved. Maybe some other day I'll take Jesus serious. Maybe some other day. But I got too much living to do. You don't know what living is until you've met Jesus Christ. You don't know what living is. The things of this world that do nothing but cause you hurt. The things of this world that bring you, oh, they'll bring you temporary joy. Sure they will. But at the end of it, when the sensation is gone, these things go away, you're left feeling empty and looking for your next fix of something worldly, something fleshly, to fill that void in your heart and in your, in, your, in your life. But I'm here to tell you that only Jesus can fill that. Only Jesus can give you the purpose that you were made for. You were made for a purpose. You were made by Him for Him. You weren't made by accident. You weren't made to just go and live just however you want and just see whatever happens at the end of the day. You were made to honor God. You were made to serve Him. You were made to have fellowship with Him. He didn't make the animals for that reason. He didn't make the angels for that reason. The angels will worship him. The seraphim will worship him and gather around his throne. But I'm here today. He made you to have a relationship with you. You are special. Amen. And because of that, you are worth it to the Lord to go and pay the debt that, or pay for your debt like he did on the cross. Let's dive right in. Uh, it, we're going to look at a point here that it all starts with Jesus giving his life for ours. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 26. And we'll be in the main part of our message now. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 42. Jesus hasn't been arrested yet, which is such a hard term because when he did nothing wrong, there's no reason to arrest him, but he was arrested. But before that, in verse 36, it says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. This is the Lord being sorrowful and very heavy, by the way. And verse 38 says, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. What a brave man's prayer, for sure. And, as, and he came, cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. How much the Lord loves us. Sir, honestly, you can see right there, plain as day, that he was going through an issue there, that he was not happy. He was not saying, well, let me go and run down to the cross right now. There was, there was a, a situation there where if there was another way, he was looking for another way. But nevertheless, not what he wanted, but what the Father wanted. That's God the Father. And he submitted unto that, even unto death. But he asked, you know, they talk about Jesus having an inner, inner circle. He had 12 disciples, and there were other disciples too, by the way. And a lot of times, many left him over much littler things. And he had people that loved him and things like that. But he asked Peter, James, and John to go in with him. This was his inner circle. And he wanted them to come and pray with him. And they go in there and they go to sleep. Now, what do you do when you're tired? You go to sleep. They were weary. They had no idea really what was taking place. And, and therefore, you know, they didn't take it that serious. Where Jesus is praying in a way for his life. That if there be any other way, Father, would you let this cup pass from me? But then he says, Oh, Father, if, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. It was God's will before he ever created this planet, this uh, solar system, this universe, you and I, that he was going to send his precious son, Jesus Christ, to be the lamb that would be slain for you and me. That he would be spotless, he would be blameless, and he would be innocent, even though we are so guilty. And he loved us before we ever loved him. That so much that he would go and die 
on a cruel tree on the cross of Calvary so you and I could go free. What a wonderful Savior we have. Yeah. He was beaten and bruised. He was disrespected. Yeah. Mentioned that just a couple minutes ago. Because He loves you. The Scripture is plain. By, our, by His stripes, we are healed. And people say, how can, it be, how can somebody actually take a whip and bust open the back of our Savior? And folks, we talked on Thursday night. When they scourged somebody, they whipped them from the tops of their shoulders all the way down to the backs of their heels and didn't miss anything. And where one Roman centurion or guard, whoever was doing the dirty deed, was hitting you on one side, after he pulled back, there was one on the other side that hit you again. Now listen, I was raised, to, my father did not spare the rod. And he did not spoil me in so many words. I got, I got spankings when I was a kid. When I got out of line, you know what? I got spanked. And I, it was never anything anywhere close, anywhere close to something like that. Probably he went easy on me a lot of times. My father was being very merciful to me. But uh, they were not merciful to him there in the Roman court. And they, they were there seeking to do him extra harm. They wanted to absolutely obliterate him. Folks, the devil was there. You read all the gospel accounts. You don't read anywhere where it says, and the devil stirred him up. Or the devil was standing right there. But you know his way. He got into the angry mob. He got them to turn against Jesus Christ. We're just a week ago. We were celebrating Palm Sunday. And they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus is the king. Welcome. And this is so exciting. Woohoo! And a week later... They're yelling, crucify him. Get him out of here, this blasphemer. Crucify him. People are fickle. And I'll take this time to stop and, I guess for lack of a better term, rabbit trail briefly. You know, a lot of people try and stay away from the Lord, and they'll try and stay away from church because of a bad experience that they had. But don't blame that bad experience on God. God's never done you wrong. Well, God didn't answer my prayers. How do you know? How do you really know? See, we got to pray in God's will. It may not be exactly how we want it or exactly what we want it, but you know what? Hey, Romans 8.28 is very clear. And he takes care of his own. He takes care of us and he loves us. And all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If you are his child, he loves you. Look, you don't need to see it today. And I know you want to. You can't wait to see it. You can't wait to see what's waiting for us. You know, you, can't, you get excited. You know, some of you are thinking about Easter dinner, and you can't wait. I can't wait to see that roasted ham sitting on the table. What's it going to look like this year? What are we going to have for the fixings on the side? I can't wait. I can smell it now, and I can't wait. I'm going to rip it up. It'll be there for you. If the Lord's willing for it not to get burnt, we'll get out of here on time. So you pray. <laughs> and the crowd groans. But... And look, you, you want to you, you want to you know pray for that loved one. They're sick, they're dying, and you just want to see the Lord do a miracle and just reach down and touch them and raise them up, folks. I'm 31 years old and I've seen it happen, and I've heard testimony of it happening. People who were on their way to you know to leaving this world, the Lord was merciful and rose them up. So I don't believe that. Believe what you want. I'm not here to try and you know argue with you or convince you. I know what I've seen and I believe in the Lord's power. If he, what, he can't heal because we're not writing down the Bible anymore? We can't heal because he's not physically walking around on the earth? He most certainly does heal, and he can heal. Amen. Sometimes that's not his will. Yep. You say, well, that doesn't do me any good. you got to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. There's been times where people have passed, and it's brought more people to Christ. There are some people that have gotten saved at the funeral of a loved one because they wouldn't go to church when that loved one was alive. But when that loved one passed away and they heard a good gospel message, they said, enough's enough, I need to get saved. And they get saved. The Lord has a way that... Why worry yourself in trying to figure out every little thing? We like to have so much control, don't we? We just like to have to figure everything out. Folks, when you're in God's arena, it's just not going to happen. He's, he's far above us. That's right where he belongs. Let's just trust him. You know, we you know, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's good. I don't need Jesus to descend from heaven and, and come up here and, and wave around and say, it's okay, folks, I'm real. You can believe in me now. I don't need to see that. My faith one day will be sight, as sure as you're sitting here and I'm standing up here spitting and barking at you. I'll see him, I'll see him someday. And if you're saved today, you will too. If you're not, you need to get saved. Why fight it anymore? What, what is holding you back? There's nothing that this world can offer you that Christ cannot make better by a million times. You'll have hard days. You'll go through hardships. There'll be times where you too will probably pray, Lord, if there be some way, let this cup pass from me. I can't handle the burdens that are on me. But nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but yours. We don't ask for hard times to come our way, do we? But they happen. 
Whether you're living on the mountaintop spiritually or you're down in the valley, you're somewhere up and down the slope. You're going to have hard times. It's a matter of who you're going to trust in to help you get through there. You will have hard times, but there's a Savior there that wants to help you through it and wants to prove to you that, hey, I am your God and I will see you through. Would God be as uh, uh, magnificent and wonderful if it hadn't been for the bad times in the Bible? What if the Hebrews never were stopped by the Red Sea? What if they just went on and the army uh, of Egypt and Pharaoh never could catch up to them? That's a bad situation. What do we do? We're trapped. God says, watch this. He parts the waters and gives them dry land to walk across. Yeah. Hey, you three Hebrew children, if you refuse to bow to me, you'll be thrown in a fiery furnace. They say, okay, so be it. If the Lord sees fit to uh, deliver us, then he will. But if not, we will not bow to a false god. Amen. Hey, didn't we throw three people into this furnace? There's an image like under the Son of God. There's a fourth one in there. That's a bad situation. Anybody here going to raise their hand and volunteer to hop into a furnace? It killed the guards that were supposed to throw them in there. The heat was so great. But they went in boldly in their faith. Because of a bad situation, God did good through it. When the church began to be persecuted in the time of Acts and beyond, you know, it's something that seemed so terrible. Christians were being hunted down. They were being killed. And, and all these different things, things were being taken from them. So they were forced to scatter. But you know what happened when they scattered? New churches were planted. New souls were saved. And new countries that were hearing the gospel for their first time. Amen. Seems like it all was lost. But yet the Lord used it for good. Yeah. You know, I think about... You know, there's a lot of focus on the disciples and the men on the Bible, but I want to take a second to appreciate the ladies that were there. They didn't flee. They stayed there and they wept and they looked after Jesus. Jesus' own mother had to sit there and watch as he was nailed to a cross, knowing who he was. That's hard. That's tough. The ladies were faithful. The men, they, they ran. They, they skinned out. They were scared. All of the things that the Lord went through for us. You know, in Matthew 27, verse 50, you know, they couldn't kill him. He gave up his ghost. Yeah. He gave up his ghost. That's incredible. And we're, all we're doing right now is just laying a, a, a groundwork of what Jesus went through for you. Don't think of, oh, look what he, yes, he did it for the whole world. But think about you as an individual today. A lot of times, it's not hard for us to think about ourselves. Most people tend to think about themselves quite a bit, you know, in society. But think about yourself and all the things that you've done, saved or not sure, wherever you're at in your life right now, and think to yourself, Jesus was thinking of me every time he took a swarp with that whip. He thought of me when they pushed that crown of thorns down on my head. He thought of me when they drove the nails through his hands and his feet. He thought of me while he hung on that cross. He thought of me. And folks, I don't know where, what your life is like. You may feel like you don't matter to anybody, and I can hear, tell you for a certainty that's not true because if nothing else, you matter to Christ. He loves you. And the world will throw you and spit you out and chew you up and just absolutely treat you like you're nothing more than, uh, you know, just, just yesterday's news. But I'm here to tell you, the Lord, he loves you so much and he has you on his mind all the time. Amen. He's alive. Amen. He loves you. And he went to an old rugged cross and he hung there and he bled. And they wagged their heads at him mocked him. Oh, well, if you're the son of God, come on down from there. You think Jesus couldn't come down from three, uh, three little nails up on a cross? You think he couldn't open up the earth and swallow up his adversaries right there? But no, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He died for the people making fun of him, just as he died for you good church-going folk here today. He died for Pontius Pilate. He died for Herod. He died for all of us. Not just the people we like to think he died for. The kids and, the good again, the good church-going folk. He died for everybody. He died for Saul of Tarsus, who he's going to be persecuting uh, the Christians and hunting them down, trying to kill them, imprison them, all these different things. He saves them and then turns them into one of the greatest preachers this world's ever known. Converted who knows how many people to Christ. Because he's got a divine plan. You know, the next thing we want to look at, we talk about the greatest event in history. You know, history records the sacrifice of Christ. It records it. There are at least seven extra-biblical or non-biblical, however you want to put it, historians that wrote about the things that took place at the crucifixion of Christ. Pilate was one of them. He wrote a letter back to Rome about the things that took place. Talked about the sun being darkened for three hours. Origen wrote of it. 
uh, Phlegon. I'm probably not saying half of their names right, but you, you get it. It sounds Greek, right? It sounds smart. So these people wrote of it. And with the, uh, the three hours of darkness, if you're in, uh, I think actually we need to be in Matthew 27 for this. Yes. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 and 46. There were supernatural things. See, man doesn't always move. When the Lord's trying to move and do something, uh, man it can be just as stubborn as can be, but the rocks couldn't help themselves. They were split in two. The sun was darkened. The, the, the things of this world, the natural parts of this world, were completely thrown off because of the power of the Lord. We're going to look at some of these things. The three hours of darkness. So in verse 45 and verse 46, in chapter 27, And it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land, unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And what a, what a verse that is in and of itself. But you consider it something that was a natural phenomenon. And many people want to say, well, it was just an eclipse. Now, how many of you have been around and seen an eclipse? I have, or at least seen it on the news. They don't last three hours. Matter of fact, at the time of year when Jesus was crucified, it would have been an uh, actual impossibility for the moon to come in and cover up the, uh, the sun and actually create an actual eclipse. Uh, because the moon, it was in uh, a, the full moon phase, I guess scientifically, that, uh, there can never be a full moon giving an eclipse. They actually said that the sun failed, and that Pilate said that the, blood became, the moon became as blood on that day. And that you could see the stars up in the heavens, but they had no luster. That it was just dull. The, the very lights that were in the heavens were dull. And it was darkness upon the, the whole world, the Bible says, and for a space of three hours. That's incredible. I can't back this up. This is just me using my imagination. I wonder if that was the time when all the sins of mankind were put on, and that's why it was darkened. I can't back that Again, I can't say that it is. I just wonder if that's what it is. Or maybe it was just a sign from God, whatever it may be. But it did happen. And there are many, uh, like I said, up to seven different accounts saying that that is absolutely true. Some of them would say that they were even looking to disprove it, but there was nothing that they could say. It was a phenomenon that they could not explain. Some of the biggest thinkers in that area at that time. The next thing that took place, the temple veil rent from top to bottom. This is important. And this is something that you can get a hold of because, uh, you know, in the temple veil, it was a foot thick. Think about a fabric that's a foot thick. The whole idea of it was not just any man could have access to God in the Old Testament times. You just couldn't just go in and say, well, I'm going to pray to the Lord and, and get my forgiveness or ask him to, you know, heal so-and-so or whatever. Sin could not enter past that, that curtain. And it made it very tough for a man to get in and have any kind of communication with God. But the moment that Jesus gave up his ghost, the temple veil was rent from top to bottom, as only God could do. A foot thick fabric, that, that's thick. And he just ripped it from top to bottom. There's no more keeping you away from communication with God because Jesus is our mediator. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Now you can talk to him just as much as you want. Because the sacrifice was made, the sin was dealt with, it was paid for. And if you accept, if you repent of your sins, you'll trust in Christ as your Savior. You have that constant communication with God. Isn't that special? How much more can God love you? He's already died for you. He's broken down all the barriers to where now you can freely speak to him. He'll take care of you. He loves you. We've still got more to go. The next thing that takes place, the earthquake. All right, the earthquake. We'll look at verse 50 and, and read down a little bit. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. You know what that means when the rocks rent? It doesn't mean they were looking for a place to live and they were going to pay it on a month-to-month -month basis. They were ripped apart. Ripped. I don't know anything in this world that is strong enough that could rip a rock in half other than the power of God. Now, think, if you're standing here, you were part of the crowd for several hours that were standing here mocking him, laughing at him and stuff, and wagging your head, and this, that, and the other thing, and all of a sudden, things start going on that aren't normal, and things are getting dark. The earth is shaking, the temple veil is rent in twain, and these rocks are splitting right before you. All of a sudden, people are going to start to, they're going to move a little bit. They're going to move a little bit. And, again, 
plenty of historical uh, accounts. That you can actually check out. There's a government website. It's it's like NOAA or something like that. I can't remember. I should have wrote it down. But you can actually search for earthquakes from the year 0 AD to 100 AD. Click on Israel. Look at the year 33. And you can see that there was a major earthquake that took place in Israel, Palestine on, in the year 33, which is when Jesus was crucified. They may have taken it down. I mean, who knows? With the type of government we have now, they probably don't want anybody to ever search and find any kind of actual, uh, you know, more evidence that there was a Christ. We didn't need that, though, today, did we? We don't need to go on that website to know that Jesus died in uh, uh, AD 33 and that he, uh, you know, all these things happened. We believe it. Something else took place. The graves opened up and the saints started walking around and went down into Jerusalem. Now that'd be something else. I can't think of another way to put it. Uh, no other gospel account talks about that, but Pilate talked about that. Origen talked about that. The saints of old. They, there were people that came up out of their graves and walked around. You said, this stuff, there's no way it's real. You really don't think the Lord could do these things. You really don't think it. Now, it's interesting because when you read about that, uh, in verse 53, it says that he came out of the graves after his resurrection. See, this happened after Jesus' resurrection. This wasn't right at the moment. This is something that happened a few days later, three days later. But they were walking around in the holy city and appeared unto many. That's incredible. Folks, the world, it, it, it just it can't comprehend the power and the might of Jesus Christ. And when you look at all these things that happened, these Old Testament saints, the ones that would have came out and appeared to many, that's, that's, that's amazing. See, what happened was, Jesus, when he went down, uh, he held captivity captive. He rescued those that were in paradise and took them up to heaven. That, that's, in, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Here's a big one. The centurions. The centurions. The ones, very well could have been the ones that actually drove the nails. But certainly the ones that stood guard at Jesus' body while he was up on the, on the cross. It says in verse 54, Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. I'm here to tell you, in my full belief, I believe those centurions got saved that minute. Anybody care to argue it? Because if you're going to argue it, on what grounds? If they saw Jesus and recognized and believed in their hearts that he was the Son of God, isn't that what you did? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So these guys got saved. I believe that. You know, we like to overcomplicate salvation so many times, but if they believed on the Son of God, I believe they got saved. I believe a lot of people ended up after that. People said, oh, I think we just made a big mistake. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And they believed on that time. Amen. Now, we'll fast forward through this. Uh, for sake of time, you know, we come down to number three. The part where, hey, he's not dead anymore. He lives. He's alive. Amen. Matthew 28, verses 5 through 9 gives the account for that. Uh, it says, and the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not. Ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Amen. That's what we're doing here today. That's what this all culminates from. He isn't dead. Folks, Buddha's dead. You know, uh, Confucius is dead. Muhammad's dead. These, these people, are, they're all dead. But Jesus is not dead. He's alive. He's the only one worth giving any worship to, let alone all of it. The holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He is the only one worthy to be praised. He's the only one that would die for you. Nobody else would do that for you, I take your place on an old rugged cross but he loved you so much he took the, the sin upon the world and he took the shame and even so much where he said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me there was a time while he was up on that cross where God turned his back on his son as he took on the sins of the world folks we're spoiled as can be you couldn't ask for a better heavenly father to give you such a gift as his son Jesus Christ so you could go free your sins are forgiven as far as the east is from the west your sins are buried in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up against you again. The devil doesn't forget them. Your flesh will have trouble forgetting them, but God has forgotten them. Don't bring it up against yourself anymore. Get rid of it. Leave it at the feet of Jesus and go. 
If you look at verse 9, look at what it says. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Well, yeah, because the foot is the lowest part on the body. Where else would you really grab Jesus? You curl up around his feet and, say, and probably say, Lord, we love you. You, you you're, you're, you're alive. You're, you're our, our Savior. Please don't ever leave again. We love you. And just hold on to his feet. How special. In the account of Luke 24, verses 5 through 9, the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Well, that's a silly question. That's a good point. Why would I go seek the living among the dead? He is risen. And he's alive forevermore. And folks, now is the time to be right with the Lord. You don't know that you have tomorrow. Folks, you know, our... Our prayer list, it gets bigger by the month. I have three staple copies. It used to, it was just one side. There's three staple copies because there's a lot of prayer that's, that people need. Some on here are here for salvation. Some are here because they're sick or their loved ones are sick. Some are here because there's problems at work, problems in the family, problems, whatever it may be. There's a lot of things they need prayer for. I'm glad that I've got a God that will listen to every single one of them. And he is able to answer. Yeah. But that's a lot to deal with. And it's going to keep growing. Now, for those of you who come on Thursday nights, is it not exciting when someone says, hey, you know what, we can take this off the list. God answered that prayer. And we're like, amen. And we strike it off there. And then there's three more to take its place. That we're going to trust in God to take care of in his own time. Because he lives. He can. Yeah. Folks, so many times I think people just, they want to look at Jesus like he's about as real as Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. He's just he's a nice story, something to really look out for the kids and stuff. But once you get older, you don't need that kind of thing. Or real men don't go to church. They don't, they don't listen to all that kind of stuff. Real men are the ones, real men are the ones that will go down on their knees and weep over their families and over themselves and when they're sinful. Real men will get down and do that and magnify that there is one mightier than they in their household, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's real men. A real man will take responsibility for the things that they've done. And they'll get right with the Lord. And even when... I'm not trying to pick on guys. I'm one up. But you know, even when we fall short, the Lord's still there to willing to forgive us and get us back on track. Amen. Not throw us away. Right. Not say, well, you're done. Bye. He'll draw you. Come on now, you've ran away long enough. Let's go. Come on back. Come on back. I love you. I've missed you. I was watching my, my son all over. He started watching a show. I think I actually like it more than him now. Superbook. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, it's an animated show. And this guy, his, uh, his dad, super, super smart, you know, a real scientist, and he makes all these inventions and whatever. Anyway, there's this super book. It, it transports the children when it's time for them to learn a lesson into the pages of the Bible itself and, and, and shows them what it's like. And uh, it's, it's good. The, the theme song gets me, it gives me chills. It's like a little 30 second thing. I listened to it three times before I, I wrote down the sermon because it just, you know, it's, his word is forever a live super book. And, there's, and the kids are singing Hosanna in the background and stuff. And it just makes you want to shout. This is a kid's show, by the way. Maybe it says, well, you need to know about me. <laughs> Maybe. But they did one of the prodigal sons. And it's probably my favorite parable in the whole Bible. Because it's a reminder that even when I make a bad decision to stray from the Lord, He never stopped being my Heavenly Father. Amen. You know, He'll allow me to make my own decisions. He's not some tyrannical ruler that has to, you know, handcuff you and keep you marching in line and things. There are things that if you listen to it and you did march in His line, you'd be much better for it. But nevertheless, we... See something that is distracting, we run towards it. And it showed his youngest son, you know, going, give me all that's supposed to be mine. He takes, my, he takes his inheritance, goes out, blows it all. And, uh, you know, there he is down there feeding the hogs. And he would, you know, feign to eat the husks. And came to himself and said, if I just come back, maybe my father would accept me back as a servant. 
Didn't even consider the fact of still being a son. And when they seen him afar off, his father seen him, he ran out and met him, and he fell on his neck, he wept, and he kissed him. I think about God the Father, it's just nothing more than if they'll just make the decision to come back to me, to draw whatever it is, and come back. Folks, I don't know, you may have been saved a long time ago. Maybe you got away from him. Well, come back. It's that simple. Come to yourself. Remember what Jesus did for you. Sometimes we just forget, don't we? Sometimes we forget. We're living in a world where they've done plenty of forgetting. They forget history, so they're just destined to repeat it. We see it all the time. The world could have been spared a lot of agony and heartbreak in a lot of different countries if they'd have paid attention to the failures of those before. If you don't consider the ways of the Word of God and you don't follow them, you're going to have heartache, you're going to have grief, you're going to have problems just about every step you have. Oh, there may be little times where things go all right, but ultimately you're going to struggle. And you're going to be looking everywhere. Look to the Lord. Go back to the one who saved yeah. you. Go, Just go back. What, why run from him anymore? Anybody, have you ever been happy in your time running from the Lord? Probably not. In our foolishness and our stubbornness and pride, we'll say, well, yeah, you know what, because I can do it. He, I know he's there. I got, I got other things to do. No. Submitting to the only one who could save your soul. That's what you need to do. And open yourself up to him and say, Lord, here am I. You're not capable of being perfect, folks. Hard thing to wrap our minds around. You, you, you get a, especially a day like today where you, you know, some of you might be ready to take on hell with a squirt gun. You know, like, come on, devil, let's uh, give me everything you got. Let's go. We're gonna, we're gonna take you down, and you can run right through a wall. There may be some in here that's like, I don't know, I got a lot of things to figure out in my life. There may be some in here that's like, when is this guy gonna be done? Hey, we, hey it happens. I don't hate you for that. I'm not happy. But no, no, folks, the Lord is long suffering towards us and merciful. He didn't just go up there and take all the punishment that he did. He didn't go up there and hang on a cross for you to make a mistake and say, well, then that person's dead to me or something like that. No, he's long suffering. He loves you. He loves you. If you're his own, he'll chastise you. He just has ways of bringing you back. It's Resurrection Sunday. I'll close with this point. It is the greatest event that ever happened to mankind because it's the only thing that could have saved mankind from hell. Yes. The thing that so few people walk in the face of the earth even give two thoughts about, really, is the most important thing, their eternity. Folks, it's not, hey, I, hey, I get it. It's not always something that's fun to sit back and think about for what the alternative to heaven is. It's hell, and it's a real place. And so many people, they, you, when you witness to them and say, listen, you know, you, you need to repent from your sin. Oh, you call me a sinner? They jump right in there. If you tell me I'm going to hell and all that stuff, well, I'm telling you that if you don't accept Christ and his gift and what he did for you on the cross, yes. But they don't want to hear about, oh, wow, he did pay for my sin. He did do that. It's just like, I don't care. You're telling me I'm a bad person. Oh, you probably think you're better than me and whatever. You know, you can, you can take your religion and, you know, take a hike kind of thing. Listen to the love of what I'm telling you. I was in your state, too. I was lost and on my way to a devil's hell, but God, who is rich in mercy, saw fit to send his son Jesus to die on the cross and raise again on the third day to give me victory over those things, and he did the same thing for you. Won't you let it go? Amen. Won't you let it go? But you know, even with the rich young ruler, Jesus looked after me and said he loved him. But he let him make his own decision. That rich young ruler decided that his riches in this world was more important. So he walked away. And Jesus didn't chase him. He didn't try and bargain with him. So, well, wait, wait, wait. Okay, listen. Take what you're doing here for a time. Come back and see me in a little bit. And let's see if we're in a better place and we can get saved then. The man was making his choice. And he allowed him to make his choice. That's a case that doesn't matter. You know, riches or anything else like that. It's anybody. You get a choice to make. That's how much the Lord loves you. He's not going to force you. He's going to let you, if you'll so choose. You believe the Lord loves you today? A couple. Folks, he does. And he's here. He's here with us today. Maybe he's speaking to your heart and he's bidding you to come. Don't fight him. The angels rejoice over one soul. Just one soul that comes to repentance. And that child that may have wandered off in sin and comes back, 
Look, the father of the house and the prodigal son, hey, let's slay the fattest calf. Let's have a party. Let's get let's let's celebrate this. Not sit there and scold you and beat you down for what you did, but rather that you got it right. And we'll just forget it. We'll forget it. If you're here today and you just want to get closer to the Lord, whatever it is, you just mind it. We're going to have an invitation now. And if the Lord spoke to your heart, just move. Mind it. Do what he said. Let's stand on our feet, bow our heads in a word of prayer.